Welcome back, everyone, as we continue our look at the story of Sitting Bull. If you didn't see my first reaction to episodes one and two of this series, the link is in the description as well as a link to part three uh, from Extra History so you can see it without my commentary. Definitely want to continue to support our uh, original content creators so they keep making great content that gives us a place to come and talk about history. Uh, so we're diving into the Battle of the Little Bighorn today. Uh, as I mentioned before, my friend JD at the History Underground is in the middle of a series right now from the Little Bighorn Battlefield. Uh, you won't want to miss that, so make sure you check out the History Underground and subscribe so you can see all of his videos. He's got four videos in total that are coming. Uh, the first one's already out. All right, let's go ahead and dive into part three, Battle of the Little Bighorn. President Grant has set a deadline. After January 1st, 1876, the U.S. Army will treat any Plains Indians not living on reservations as enemy combatants. It's a decision long in the making. Two years ago, an expedition led by George Armstrong Custer discovered gold in the Black Hills. But per the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, those hills belonged exclusively to the Lakota. Regardless, American miners are flooding into the mountains. And this is the problem. They never should have been there. If they had avoided being there in the first place that wouldn't have found gold and there wouldn't be this issue uh but inevitably th this is why if you are on the native american side why should you possibly believe any treaty that comes out of that government if they're just going to violate it there's no reason for you to trust this especially when it's already restricting you from your way of life which is to be a group of people who are kind of nomads who, who wander who go from one place to another where the sources of food are and where the resources are and the government doesn't have the political will to evict them no for years grant tried to buy the black hills from the lakota but they're not interested in selling the entire concept to them is absurd. Not only are they sacred, they're also the best hope of feeding themselves independent of government annuities. But a financial crisis in 1873 has made the government broke and the country needs that gold to restart its economy. And let's offer some context as well. This is in the height of what we call Reconstruction, which is uh, the time period after the American Civil War where the South is being reconstructed in the aftermath of the end of slavery and the aftermath of the destruction of the war. There's a lot of severe racial tension and violence and murder going on. Uh, you've got a lot of uh, what are called carpetbaggers in the South. You've got a lot of northern politicians that are down in the South running those governments. The South's being readmitted. Political uh, capital is being spent on all of that. And the North, uh, the people in the North are kind of getting tired of Reconstruction. They're, they're kind of uh, giving up on the idea of being successful with all of that. And, and public opinion is turning away from that. The, the panic of 1873 costs hundreds of thousands of jobs. This is a time period that, until the Great Depression, will be known as one of the worst uh, economic crises in American history. Uh, it's all happening at the same time. So, Custer and the U.S. Cavalry are coming back once more. But this time, Sitting Bull will be there to meet him at the legendary Battle of the Little Bighorn. Thanks so much to Story Learning for helping to support important historical stories. There are a few periods of Sitting Bull's life that get a little obscure, documented only through oral histories and contemporary U.S. government reports, and the years between 1866 and 1874 are definitely one of those periods. But what we do know is that while Sitting Bull was a peripheral figure in Red Cloud's War, these were also the years that his reputation grew as both a leader of great spiritual power and a rallying point for resistance. Sitting Bull's policies of no treaties, no accommodation, and no agreement to live on reservations drew a stark contrast between him and Red Cloud, who, as part of the 1868 treaty, was trying to adjust to reservation life. And as time goes on, there are fewer and fewer people who are going to be neutral in these events. You're going to eventually start to, to gravitate to one side or the other. And so by the time we get to the mid-1870s, the people that are surrounding Sitting Bull, these are the hardcore. These are the people who have held out, who have not given in, who have not relented, and are going to fight to the death. 
But as we've mentioned before, living on a reservation and accepting goods from the agencies wasn't always a binary choice. Some groups actually took an in-between route, deciding they would live on the reservation in winter, when they'd be stationary anyway, and then slip out to follow the buffalo in summer. Others had tried depending on the agencies, until the federal government missed the promised food deliveries, driving their starving people to hunt out of desperation. So again, you have people who otherwise might have gone along with this, but the, the federal government's not holding up its end of the bargains on these treaties. And so even people who might have agreed are going to be pushed to those margins to the likes of Sitting Bull to support him because what other choice do they have? Some even found that Sitting Bull had been right when he warned that relying on the government put the Plains tribes at their mercy. When Indian agents didn't like certain behavior or cultural practices, they withheld rations as a form of control. Mm. And the young men... That's exactly what we talked about yesterday. Sitting Bull, I mean, he said if you are relying on them for your food, pretty soon they're going to start putting conditions on that as a means of you accepting it. And, and it gives them complete control over your way of life especially found the reservations constrictive. Plains tribes were often warrior societies, where men achieved rank, status, and masculine pride through feats in hunting or war. But sedentary reservation life meant giving up intertribal combat and buffalo hunts, which was distasteful to young men eager to prove their bravery. Then, of course, there was the government's increasing pressure to sell the Black Hills, or its offer to displace the Sioux Confederation and move them to Indian Territory in what is now Oklahoma. So, all of those people, whether disaffected, starving, or disillusioned, flowed into Sitting Bull's camp, seeking both strength in numbers and his reputation as a holy man. Not only the Lakotas either, but the Cheyennes as well, all in a massive unity camp. Yep. One account claims he was the leader of all of the Sioux, but this is plainly false. However, what is true is that Sitting Bull drew an unprecedented following by offering a clearly stated alternative to accepting the reservation system. Namely, that he would refuse to comply with Grant's deadline, continue hunting, and stay as far away from white people as possible. Should the army attack his group, he would fight, and any war would be defensive. But that winter, Sitting Bull's camp swelled even further, this time with refugees. When Grant's deadline... And one of the things we haven't really talked about, of course, is Sitting Bull's family, and he's got children, some of which are young, are very young at this point. Sitting Bull is... Uh, what, late 30s, early 40s at this point. He, he's right around. He's a little bit younger than I am today. Um, so he's got his own family to think about in all of this. Past. The U.S. Army invaded the Powder River and Little Bighorn regions in a three-pronged assault, hoping to sweep up any non-compliant tribes and instigating what would come to be known as the Great Sioux War of 1876. These federal troops were aided by the Crow and Shoshone, hoping to gain back their traditional territories that the Lakota and Cheyenne had captured in the 1850s, then been granted to them in the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty. The federals changed tactics as well, attacking several non-compliant villages in winter. The survivors poured into Sitting Bull's unity camp, and he ordered his warriors to meet them with gifts of buffalo meat and robes. By this time, the camp had swelled to 10,000 people and 2,500 warriors, possibly the largest gathering of Plains people in history. Mm. Still, he... And, and, the, and the ironic part is that the moment that Custer hits them, they're getting ready to move again. Uh, so if he'd come there a day later or two, two days later, they might not have been there. Or they, it might have been that he didn't come upon them until all three parts of this column had combined. He needed more. He sent ambassadors out to the reservations, recruiting warriors, and called for a sun dance, a ritual of self-sacrifice to gain a vision from the Great Spirit. So, his adopted brother, who'd taken his father's name Jumping Bear, helped him carry out the offering. A hundred pieces of flesh from his arms, each the size mm. of a pinhead. Then, bleeding, with a leather tether pierced through his chest, securing him to the center pole of the lodge, he danced while staring at the sun and breathing through a bone whistle. He continued doing so without food or water for nearly two days. That's when he saw the vision of the blue coats falling upside down like grasshoppers into the camp and a voice saying, They have no ears. Hmm. Yes. They can't hear you. There would be a great victory over the blue coats, he said upon waking. But in a way, there would actually be two. On June 17th, the Oglala Lakota leader, his horse is crazy, better known as Crazy Horse, 
ambushed one of the three columns near the Rosebud Creek. And you know, that's important because understanding what the name really was does kind of change the implications of it. His horse is crazy. But this is, again, this is just uh, English-speaking Americans changing it to something that sounds more like we would talk. Uh, nobody's going to say, oh, look, there's his horse is crazy, but it's a lot easier to say, oh, there's crazy horse. But the Army's Crow and Shoshone allies spotted the attack and delayed Crazy Horse's advance long enough that he lost the element of surprise. So what might have been a total victory turned into a grinding six-hour battle as Crazy Horse led 1,000 warriors in assault after determined assault against U.S. forces, which fired up to 25,000 rounds of ammunition. This Battle of the Rosebud, or as the Lakota Cheyenne call it, the battle where the girl saved her brother, after mm. a dramatic rescue, effectively stopped the U.S. column's advance. As a result, these troops were not present eight days later when Custer's detachment from the 7th Cavalry came upon the Unity Camp at the river the Lakota called Greasy Grass, and the Americans knew as the Little Bighorn. June 25th, 1876, the Unity Camp at Greasy Grass. So... Custer, as he's mentioned a couple times now, there are these multiple columns. Custer's technically not the commanding officer of the 7th Cavalry. He's a lieutenant colonel. He's the second in command, the the XO. But the, the colonel doesn't actually go out on these expeditions with the cavalry. Uh, so he's, by default, the one leading the uh, the troops. And, and there's uh, six, 700 of them in the 7th Cavalry. They are really, really far from their home base. So they're carrying with them what they can. Uh, he had the option of bringing some Gatling guns along, but he thought it would slow them down. Uh, they're carrying only so much ammunition. They're using weapons that are single shot breech loaders. And so, and they would tend to jam sometimes. And so you'd find yourself having to dig out the shell before you could reload it, uh, which were, they had a better range. But once you got into close combat, you were screwed. And that's one of the main factors that doesn't get talked enough about uh, in this battle is that many of the Native Americans, they either had bows and arrows or they had repeaters. And so once they got in within the range of their own guns and bows and arrows, they had far superior firepower to the cavalry. When he first hears the sound of gunshots, Sitting Bull runs to his tent. As an old man chief, he will not be expected to fight directly, but the camp is full of women and children, and he will need to help evacuate them. While doing so, he sees his nephew White Bull preparing his war medicine. So Sitting Bull picks up his own shield, the one that his father mm. had gave him, and puts it into his nephew's hand. He will need it more. And seeing the young man has an old trade musket, he tells him to drop it and hands him a stone club. This fighting will be close. Yeah. Crazy Horse is already readying warriors to take on the 700 men that long-haired George Custer has foolishly brought in scattered groups. And again, like I said in yesterday's episode, at this battle, he doesn't have long hair. He had just gotten it cut really short. Uh, he's got his brother with him, uh, two brothers, I think, uh, some other family members, a nephew uh, that's going to die with him. Uh, his, his one brother that's with him, Tom Custer, is a two-time Medal of Honor recipient from the Civil War. For the Plains Nations have over 2,000 warriors here. Sitting Bull does not take part in the battle. His part was completed during the Sundance and Gathering of Warriors. Instead, he His role is influence. His role is inspiration at this point. It's going to be guys like uh, his, his horse is crazy who are going to lead this fight. Plays the women and children and takes them to safety as on a distant hill. Crazy Horse surrounds, overruns, and crushes Custer's lead contingent. It is an so obviously they're they're telling the story of Sitting Bull here, not the story of the Little Bighorn. I have a video where I kind of break down the battle of the Little Bighorn. And I'll put that link up at the end. It was on yesterday's video as well. But basically, Custer divides his his force into mainly three parts. One of them is under Captain Benteen, and it's staying back, waiting for uh, their ammunition and supplies uh, to come up. Uh, Major Reno is supposed to attack one end of the village, and then Custer's going to go around to what he 
thinks is the other end, but he ends up finding out is actually the middle. And by the time he realizes just how massive this uh, this camp is and how badly outnumbered he is, he's already split off with about 250 of his men, and they're going to be overrun and annihilated. And that's the part that's going to be killed. The the ones under uh, Reno and Benteen, most of them are going to survive, though Reno does take quite a few casualties. They're going to go up on a hill and kind of hold out until the other columns of this three-pronged column arrive. Um, and, and so it's not Custer's entire 7th Cavalry that's wiped out. It's just the part that's with him. Overwhelming victory, like nothing any Indian tribe has achieved in the history of the United States. Five of the 7th Cavalry's 12 companies are wiped out, 286 men, including Custer himself. But Sitting Bull does not feel victory, for the vision had stipulated that they not mutilate, scalp, or steal from the dead, and in the elation, all have happened. Yeah. The news reaches Washington on July 3rd, just as festivities are spinning up for the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. The victory at Little Bighorn shocks the American government and sours the public on celebration. Yeah, think about that. Uh, this is This is what... A week and a half before the 100th anniversary of the country, uh, country's uh, independence, and uh, so it's right about that time that this is all trickling back. Really puts a damper on the patriotic celebrations when you get word that uh, uh, one of your heroes of the American Civil War and Custer was a genuine, legit, like dashing hero figure of the American Civil War, uh, has been wiped out with hundreds of his men. Uh, puts a damper on things for sure. For while disliked within the army, Custer was a figure of national prominence, a hero of the Civil War, yep. and to have him not only killed, but his command destroyed, stirs a desire for vengeance. Meanwhile, for a month, the Hunk Papa Lakota feasted and celebrated, but gradually, warriors dropped away, filtering back to the reservations. There, they found army troops ready to disarm all men and withhold food at any hint of rebellion. Cavalry flooded the Powder River country, and Congress forced through an amendment essentially forcing the Lakota to sell the Black Hills or starve without government assistance. Even Crazy Horse, that most determined warrior, eventually surrendered, only to be bayoneted to death in a struggle following an escape attempt. Yet Sitting Bull still refused to give up. Rather than surrender, he went into exile, crossing the border to Canada, where he would reside for three years. But his story was not over. For when he returned, he would don a war bonnet and take his story east. This time, not leading an army, but as the star celebrity in Buffalo <laughs> Bill's Wild West show. Wait, what? <laughs> now that's going to be a wild story. And I'm pretty sure you all know by now that we believe the best way to learn just about anything is through great storytelling. Yeah, so a uh, fascinating part of his story coming up here in just a minute. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive right into part four. Sitting Bull sits in a fort with the U.S. Army officers, telling them that he is done living in exile. Canada has been hard. His followers are hungry and ill. Three-fourths are women and children. And he himself has developed an eye condition so severe, he must protect them with green-tinted goggles. Hmm. He then tells the officers that he has brought his grandson with him and wishes for the boy to be educated in the ways of white Americans. He hands his Winchester to the boy to surrender to the soldiers. I wish it to be remembered, he says that I was the last man of my tribe to surrender my rifle. But Sitting Bull has not surrendered entirely, not truly, not in his heart. You know what? That's okay. It's okay for him in his heart to say, you know what, I, this is not the choice I want to make. But sometimes it's not about you anymore and not about your pride. Sometimes you have to lay all of that aside for what you feel is best. And when you're watching the people you love starve and die and freeze, sometimes you have to make hard choices. Thanks so much to Factor for keeping us history-loving beans well-fed fast. In the chaos after Little Bighorn, Sitting Bull's coalition of Plains tribes basically broke. Many, some who had just joined the group to hunt and had not meant to enter a battle, went back to the reservations, again appealing to the agencies for support. Others broke off in their own bands. It was, in fact, logistically impossible for the buffalo hunting lifestyle to keep such a large group supplied and fed, yeah. especially with herds dwindling. So it was only a few hundred that crossed the border with Sitting Bull into Canada, where they starved for two years. 
Now, the Canadian government was not hostile to them overall. In fact, Sitting Bull felt he had better relations with Canadian officials and even gifted one his war bonnet. But, but Canada is not that heavily populated, and so as, as much as the, the planes in the United States are sparsely populated at this time for uh, in Canada, they're even further from kind of the centers of population. Because the Canadian government said they were not based in Canada and were occupying territory set out for Canadian-based tribes, it would not issue them food or supplies. Mm. And even that far north, the buffalo still dwindled. So eventually, he returned and surrendered. Or rather, he appeared to surrender. He handed his rifle to his grandson, who then surrendered it. And that wasn't lost on his followers. Sitting Bull would try this path, but was keeping his options open. Afterwards, he boarded a riverboat, the first time he'd ridden one rather than shot at it, and visited his first major American town. The citizens of which, upon seeing the man who killed Custer, the leader of the resistance against the U.S. cavalry, promptly threw him a huge party. Oh yeah, because after Little Bighorn, everybody had become kind of obsessed with Sitting Bull. And I mean everyone. Biographies of him were published in both England and France, and American journalists chased every rumor that would explain his victory over U.S. forces. The myth that they settled on was that Sitting Bull was not culturally Lakota at all, but rather raised among white Americans, was university educated, and... Th think about the arrogance of this. Well, no Indian savage could have defeated our great Custer. The only thing that explains this is that he's really like us absurd but i get it graduated from west point supposedly he'd even studied in france and was a devotee of napoleon in fact a book of poetry and letters the works of this is what people do it's kind of like all the conspiracies that raise up around the kennedy assassination and other events like that people don't want to believe that the simplest explanation is the correct one and so in order for them to be able to accept that something happened the way it did there has to be something greater at work kennedy couldn't have been killed by some random dude in dallas uh without the help and support of the CIA or the mob or some grand conspiracy. We don't want to believe one regular dude could do that, so we invent these conspiracy theories. We don't want to believe that some savage Native American, and that I mean, I'm just saying that's the way they saw him, not the way he really was, could have done this. So he had to have been educated that way. He had to have been like Napoleon. He had there. There's something more here that explains this. Sitting Bull was falsified and entered into the Library of Congress. It suggested he not only spoke English, but also Greek, Latin, Spanish, French, Italian, and German. This narrative was actually soothing for the American public, believe it or not. Because think about it. If Sitting Bull was a university-educated proponent of Western tactics, it meant that the American public didn't have to reckon with the fact that the 7th Cavalry had been absolutely bodied by a native warrior yep. that they considered racially and intellectually inferior. Exactly. The worthier a foe Sitting Bull seemed, the better the U.S. Army and its dead hero Custer could appear. And this is done all throughout history. Julius Caesar when he would write about his battles, would regularly inflate the quality and number of his opponent to make it sound better than it really was that he'd achieved these great victories. On his way to government confinement, he signed autographs for a dollar apiece, he had been taught to sign his name in Canada, and sold personal items to souvenir collectors, though he never kept the money for himself, mind you, always using it to support the Hunk Papa band that remained with him. Mm. For the next two years of confinement in government custody, living in various times at the Standing Rock Reservation and Fort Randall, Sitting Bull would receive letters from as far away as Europe, as well as visitors from the Hunk Papa and other tribes. Photographers also came to take his portrait and interview him. Yep. But then other letters arrived also. Letters asking him to go wild westing. See, as the Indian Wars wrapped up, those living in the large cities of the East Coast and Midwest wanted to experience both the conflict and the already disappearing lifestyle of the pioneer era. But it's much like what we do with Civil War reenactors. Uh, or, you know, all the people that are going to go to Normandy for the 80th, 80th anniversary coming up in June. There's going to be people everywhere driving Jeeps and, and jumping out of C-47s and doing all this stuff to recreate what happened so long ago. No different here. But, you know, not truly. They wanted a window into a world that cast the native people whom they'd fought as noble savages that were part of a vanishing race and European forces as the embodiment of progress. 
This way of thinking was essentially a victory celebration meant to glamorize, sanitize, and legitimize the bloody and morally complex process of Manifest Destiny. Yep. Because in their eyes, it turned an act of conquest into an act of charity, while also presenting naked entertainment as educational. And the most successful empresario of this form was the former scout and bison hunter, Buffalo Bill Cody, who began trying to put a show together exhibiting Sitting Bull almost the second he arrived at Standing Rock. However, it was actually Sitting Bull's own Indian agent, James McLaughlin, the man who was supposed to oversee his custody, welfare, and rehabilitation, who began exhibiting him on stage for the first time in major Western cities. And much like has been talked about recently that happened in Canada, there were these schools that were set up where Native American children would, would be westernized, would be made into the white culture. And there were places like Carlisle, Pennsylvania, where this was going on. And it was during these tours that Sitting Bull first met Annie Oakley, the petite ambidextrous trick shooter who would thrill audiences with her ability to blast a cigarette out of her father's lips or hit targets from long distances. Sitting Bull took a shine to Oakley immediately, believing her skills indicated great spiritual power, hmm. nicknaming her Little Sure Shot, a name she'd monetize in her show career long afterward, he symbolically adopted her as a sign of favor. Wow. Though eventually, relations with McLaughlin, who was, to be clear, corruptly exploiting a prisoner, soured, and he managed to later get permission to travel with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show. His salary there would be $50 a week, and he'd retain the rights to sell his autograph, photo, and memorabilia. And it's not a terrible amount of money, but still, definitely being exploited. What would he do in this new show? Nothing. When the show set up in a new city, he would ride into the arena in a carriage at the head of the procession, and then sit in a VIP spot on the grandstand and watch the proceedings. He was literally just there to be looked at, yeah. and that was enough. There, he watched staged scenes of native warriors attacking a pioneer cabin and fort, and even a recreation of the Battle of Little Bighorn, all of which the settlers and army won, of course. But to Sitting Bull, this was worth it. For while the show ostensibly let Americans learn about the Plains tribes, Sitting Bull himself was also learning about the culture and power yep. of the government that he'd been fighting. The cities of the East Coast were massive, their populations teeming, and new people were getting off the boat from Europe every day. Imagine what this does to your psyche when you realize just how many of these people there are and how many of them are eventually coming your way. It had to have been a real shock to his system. His people had not been fighting one nation, he realized, but rather a nation that was importing settlers and soldiers from other nations. And he was shocked and upset by the poverty of these cities. Hmm. Generosity, one of the four virtues of the Lakota warrior, meant that even if a family was poor, it never had to beg. Yet here, he was followed by shoeless children, who learned that the kind chief would give them coins. Once, he stopped in front of a woman begging, and having no money, on the spot, sold three of his signatures, and placed all three dollars wow. in her hands. So if he'd wanted to learn about the United States, he was successful. But one of his other aspirations did fall flat. He wanted to meet President Grover Cleveland, and plead the Lakota's case, but the audience was brief, and he barely got to speak before Cleveland was swept along to another meeting. Uh. Nothing would come of it. Sitting Bull, disappointed and dejected, decided to go back to Standing Rock. With him, he brought a gift from Buffalo Bill, an enormous white horse from his show that had been trained to dance at the sound of gunfire. And this was a fitting gift, since a new movement called the Ghost Dance was sweeping the depleted native populations of the Great Plains. And the Ghost Dance is going to be one of those, this is really kind of the last gasp of what we call the Plains Indians Wars. Uh, and this is a classic example of how misunderstandings and not knowing one another's culture has deadly consequences. Now, the ghost dance is difficult to explain, since the religion of the Plains tribes is based on personal interpretations of spiritual experiences, so it may have meant different things to different practitioners. But put simply, it was an attempt to use ritual dance and prayer to restore the world to how it had been before European colonization of the Americas. And think about this then from the perspective of the American government. They're doing the spiritual dance because they want things to go back to the way that they were. And if they're trying to make things go back to the way that they were, that means they're going to fight. That means they're going to rise up. That means there's going to be war. And tensions start to rise. See, nothing in Lakota religion was ever really destroyed. 
the herds of buffalo, the plants, and the many, many dead family members all still existed inside of the earth from where they'd originally emerged. It was believed that should the Plains tribes join the dance, the buffalo and dead would return, and the whites would go back to Europe. At its core, it was a non-violent movement, a thing to do now that armed resistance had yeah. failed. But the increased gatherings of Plains tribes people performing the dance on reservations appeared to Indian agents and government officials like a brewing rebellion. This is just a classic example of having fear of something you don't understand. After all, most dances, such as the Sun Dance, had already been banned on reservations in the 1880s. So participation was an act of spiritual resistance. Newspapers mm. around the country, many based on erroneous or even fabricated reports, said that the reservations were full of violent revolts. And the one question on everyone's mind in 1890, when the first dances were held at Standing Rock, was, would Sitting Bull be joining the dance? It was unclear whether Sitting Bull believed in the ghost dance, though he was a very spiritual man and appeared to have at least respected it as a movement. In fact, while he never voiced support, when the dance came, he did join. And that was enough for McLaughlin. For years, he'd been writing letters calling Sitting Bull stubborn, rebellious, and criticizing how he refused to learn to farm. So he sent two native policemen to arrest Sitting Bull just in case of an uprising. But when they reached his house, Sitting Bull, true to his name, refused to get up. When they forced him, a Lakota man shot one of the policemen, who then fired a shot through Sitting Bull's chest, with a second fired into his head. Sitting Bull lies on the ground. Above him is the open sky. And they killed his teenage son as well. It wasn't just Sitting Bull that they killed. And the faces of his people looking down. He's bleeding, exhausted, in excruciating pain. For nearly three decades, he has resisted the U.S. government, handing it its greatest defeat in the Indian Wars and forcing it to examine its own character, giving all to his people until there was no more left to give. Within a day, his followers, panicked, will flee to join a Cheyenne party who had already decided to move to the Pine Ridge Reservation and the shelter of Red Cloud. Instead, they will be massacred by the vengeful 7th Knee. Cavalry at Wounded Knee. Yeah, but the same 7th Cavalry, uh, only, of course, 14 years later. Uh, and the Wounded Knee Massacre will kind of spark really kind of the end of all of this. And uh, American government's going to give out a bunch of medals of honor to the people who were involved in that massacre. And there are some reports I've read that one of Sitting Bull's sons, I think it is, uh, may have been the one responsible for fi firing the shot that set off the gunfire that leads to this massacre. Uh, but it's an ugly, ugly, ugly situation. And what a horrible uh, and very tragic end to a very honorable man. That is still in the future. Right now, Sitting Bull's eyes close. And nearby, a towering white stallion hears the shots that killed him and begins to dance. Now, I'm not going to lie here. The end of this series kind of hit me like a truck. I think you can actually hear it a little bit in my voice in those last few sentences. But something that always does lift my spirits a little bit in these moments is that we have sponsors like the folks over at Factor who believe in supporting the important historical stories we feel need to be told. All right. So there you have it. Um, if you have other stories related to this time period and this place, as far as like the Plains Indians wars and Native American culture and any of that sort of thing, I would love uh, to have your recommendations. This is a part of history that we need to talk more about. Um, so let me know your thoughts. I'll put a link up uh, here at the end. You can see where I kind of talk through the events of the Battle of Little Bighorn a little bit deeper. And like I said, definitely check out uh, JD over at the History Underground and his series about uh, the events of the Little Bighorn shot at the battlefield. Thanks for watching.